you know uh, people confuse uh, uh, mental issues uh, as uh, 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 being something which is uh, which is always related to mental disorder there are various degrees and shades of uh, mental health uh, i think sometimes people just need to vent and they don't get an opportunity to vent and therefore you know then it uh, scales up to something worse but i'm sure uh, when when there are uh, periods of low uh, if i had uh, if i didn't have my family for example uh, i would have uh, felt worse but as long as you have someone you can uh, you know, speak with uh, or you can vent uh, Maybe you cross over those troughs uh, 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 easily, or at least uh, uh, without doing too much damage to yourself. So, uh, when I was in my in the profession, I I I did uh, go through uh, mentally a lean period, which was uh, uh, constant. Uh, a debate in my mind uh, you know when i'm going to get out of the chamber where am i going to get work from so i used to uh, fuddly ask my senior so the only time we had conversation was when we were traveling from the chamber to the court so from maruti 800 my boss graduated to uh, you know that mini van we had where we had more space so the conversation took place on the way to court and uh, when we were returning from court to the chamber so i i i think i recollect uh, the constant refrain was that oh, how do you get your first brief <laughs> <laughs> and he would tell me uh, rajiv it will come to you and uh, it wasn't enough quite frankly at that time it wasn't enough i i i i, I mean you couldn't debate uh, that aspect too much uh, knowing the background that i was from because no one could hand a brief to me and uh, you know say go go and do this uh, bit or work on the brief but uh, uh, it did happen uh, that being said i'm not uh, saying that i didn't go through that uh, lean patch i did i did go through that uh, period of uncertainty and even there after when you s- start getting work it is uh, initially as i said not enough to look after your needs in the sense you need money for petrol you need money money for keeping staff you need money for consumables and uh, the 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 uh, if you have uh, uh, you know ideas of uh, uh, sort of uh, those conservative old old uh, uh, rule models in your head which is that uh, a professional doesn't go to the client the client comes to the profession you find very soon that you have no client because clients <laughs> expect you to come to them <laughs> so this constant back that i will not go to the client's office uh, was uh, a great impediment in my life hmm. and i'm sure it 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 it, it bothers uh, lots of young boys so unless someone sees uh, you at work or uh, notices the quality of your work and you're lucky enough uh, that a client walks through your office door uh, this is a huge challenge and then you know when when you are asking for work uh, the terms of negotiation are different you sit across the table he tells you what will be the fee he tells you what he need of he or she would tell you what are the working hours uh, and at times uh, uh, the client at times or at those stages in those stages the client dictates now for uh, someone who is a thorough professional this becomes very very problematic and it happens at every level uh, see it happens at the level when you are a struggler it also happens when you are a top shot in a big firm but you go to someone who's bigger than you 10 times and mm-hmm. he he says look here you know come and meet me at 10 o'clock and makes you makes you wait for 2 hours you're a partner of a big firm and drawing 200 people and you say what the, <laughs> what am i doing here 
<laughs> but then you do it because what is at stake is a huge amount of money. So I'm sure even he goes through those mental health issues as does Sagla. <laughs> I would like to revisit the question which was just answered. Um, as a judge, you know, when you're faced with uh, cases like maybe aspects of criminal law or maybe matrimony, which are difficult, which are which have some emotions involved. As a judge, does it like give you or has it given you sleepless nights? My, you know, have I made the right judgment? Uh, does that sort of create any pressure? We've spoken about the social media aspect, but. Are there any other aspects which as a judge you feel or you have felt the pressure? Have I made the right decision, you know? This was a case, it's a reported case, so I can talk about it now. This was a case where, uh, you know, someone had uh, sought permission for having uh, a liver transplant for his uh, mother, who was about uh, 75 or 80 years old. And uh, the donor was uh, some person uh, who was not related by blood. <laughs> The permission was refused by the doctor's committee formed under the act, etc. That was challenged in a repetition of form. I'm sitting as a single judge. And uh, the son, every, I mean, any anyone in this place, if I was in this place, I would do the same, wanted to save his mother. And uh, before he was challenged and he was in court with his lawyer and they were uh, very vigorously arguing that the decision needs to be reversed. Uh, I found it, I found that case very difficult in, in terms of uh, which way it should go. I mean, I could rationalize both in a sense. So I took the call of, uh, uh, you know, of taking the next step, which is uh, I called the donor and interviewed her in the chamber and I realized that uh, she was a person with, uh, who came from a modest background and about uh, three or four children out of which uh, two were girls, uh, young girls and uh, in a matter of uh, my um, conversation with her I, I, I realized that uh, she was uh, sort of uh, uh, remotely connected with them. She'd been there, her husband had been their ex employees. That's my memory of the case. So I did tell her, I said, and she wasn't very educated, etc. etc. She came from that um, society where you know, they're trying to eke out their living because her husband was an uh, auto driver or something like that. And this was a middle or an upper middle class family uh, who was in court. And I, I, I I remember talk, talking to her and asking her, do you realize uh, what happens uh, when you donate a part of your liver? The liver actually as an organ grows, it regrows. But uh, there are changes which take place in the body. And I said, do you realize what happens to your body when you do something like that? And you have young girls and do you, do you think it's the right decision? And she was actually very vehement, no, no, you know, I want to do it. And this is out of love and affection. Uh, so after I interviewed her and I heard arguments, I declined to But as Radhika just said, I, I found it very difficult to live with that uh, decision. Uh, for the first time I realized sometimes uh, justice and law at times uh, don't uh, uh, sort of convene. I, I tried to bridge that gap, but I don't know whether I bridged or not because here was a son who was trying to save his mother. It was a donor who I thought her interest needed to be secured because uh, this was not an informed consent and uh, it would affect her children, her family. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 to this date, uh, found, uh, uh, find it very difficult to you know, sort of uh, reconcile with then you move on. So there have been a couple of these cases which which actually, you know, kind of shake you up. But these are things that people don't know and we just sort of deliver and enter their process. It's very difficult. I, I keep telling people, you know, as a lawyer, I, I had the privilege of arguing uh, whatever case I did. 
and I then just sort of left it to the judge. Mm. The most difficult part uh, of a judge's life is that he puts pen to paper. And uh, if uh, if you do an honest job, it gets really tougher. It's not easy taking decisions. I mean, I, I go to the store, I can't buy myself a shirt because I can't decide <laughs> <laughs> which color would suit me, and I use uh, you know the advice of my spouse or my. Family members, or I don't go to the store. I say you pick up, and I'll wear. You know what I wear. Right. But here, I have to decide. I have to put pen to paper, which is, uh, believe you me, at times very tough. So most of the time, when you when you when you hear these instances where people uh, don't take the calls, it is perhaps because of the reason that people uh, just can't bring up uh, that. Uh, Confidence that uh, this is a matter on in which I must put pen to paper. That's the difference between uh, you know, sometimes deciding tough cases or not different deciding tough cases. Right? Because there are and, and the consequences have only become um, you know, let's say uh, worse in the sense that uh, something that we spoke about a little while back that. It's not just the litigants before you, but it's the whole lot of people who <laughs> enter the fray who have nothing to do with that litigant. The other aspects were to this, like so, one is writing judgment. The other aspect is, do uh, you take it back? Does it affect your personal space, your life? Has it impacted your decisions in life? You know, so as lawyers, just to you know, put it in context. As lawyers, when you know. I've heard my friends who take up matrimonial cases, you know, uh, somewhere they'll take the brief back and they'll have a conversation around it with their spouse and, you know, somewhere they'll start judging you with their spouse over time, you know, and does that, so my point is, does it somewhere or has it somewhere affected, any of these matters affected you as a judge, you know, any briefs which has which affected you as a judge? As a person, yeah, in your life. Mm. Well, unconsciously, it may have. I, I really can't say. Uh, frankly, I've not done too many much uh, I, I kept wondering for a very long time. I lost my mother about two, three years ago. That if I am put in the same position, what will I do? Right, right. Will I accept the decision of? Doctors' committee under the Organ Transplantation Act, and leave it at that. Mm. Uh, or would I contest it? And if I contest it, the decision is what I rendered. Will I be happy with it? I have not actually found a to that, and uh, that stays with me. That does stay with me. So yes, it does affect your life, and you know it could be any kith and kin. To be any given game, so I don't know what I'm going to do then, but it does still. Uh, and there are scores of other matters where, uh, is, uh, where you know, it could impact you. Sometimes uh, it is always uh, sometimes in the back of your mind. You don't sort Mostly of talk, subconscious. Yeah, you don't talk about it. I, I mean, you can't talk about it till it happens to you. Yes. There's another case that I, which happened. Which was about this brilliant uh, IIT graduate who's working uh, for Gale, and uh, he was uh, dismissed from service mm-hmm. on account of the fact that uh, <clears throat> he'd taken uh, a huge amount of uh, leave. And uh, the, if I recall it uh, correctly, the allegation against him was that while uh, he was on leave. He'd started his own business, and he had. So the father was in court, and he was saying, "Listen, he's a brilliant student. He's he, he's he's got himself so many patents. This is an unfair decision, etc., etc." Uh, so I remember that time when uh, when I was hearing the case, I I did put to the father. I said, "Listen, one of the ways to move forward is that you forego at least." Uh, Salary or the wages for the period you were not on duty, 
and maybe i can put it to gail and say okay reengage him and uh, you know that part can be excised which i thought was a very uh, workable solution to the problem but uh, somehow they just didn't accept that offer they just didn't accept that offer and therefore i couldn't uh, call upon gail to move in a in a direction which according to me would have uh, been a win win situation for both they would have got right. an employee back who right. was uh, undoubtedly a very uh, brilliant yeah. mind and uh, he would have got his job back uh, so after i rendered uh, the judgment i got a letter so you know this kind of thing also happened mm-hmm. people didn't write to you they think they went in a sense so they write he wrote a letter which was uh, i would call it venting but it was uh, yeah, all kinds of things were said etc so this is something that we face and suffer i mean uh, at the end of the day then i had to decide based on what i thought was the law i don't know whether i was right wrong whatever mm-hmm. that can be corrected in the appeal but then again it sort of uh, brought to fore something you know there was he had a problem he, you know he had thrombosis he found it very difficult to uh, s- stand uh, for long periods of time and therefore functioning was a problem but but uh, employers uh, look at uh, they are heartless in a sense that, you know they can accommodate you in a, uh, to a certain extent but beyond that you know business has to go on right they can't pay you for sitting at home so those are those challenges but uh, i'm sure parents of that boy have not <laughs> forgiven me <laughs> and i will live with that and that's my karma i, I just can't uh, you just can't help it you attract a lot of negativity you can't unless you find uh, a solution an amicable solution to the problem there are always one section of litigants who go away and have but having said so i must before i conclude this I also had a positive uh, uh, encounter with the litigant. Uh, this was a service matter. Mm-hmm. The litigant had approached the court uh, for the third time, I think, third or fourth time. And uh, when I started hearing his arguments, he said, "I want to address arguments on that." I said, "Yeah, sure. There's no problem. I don't know. As long as he made cogent arguments, he addressed." I heard him. I said. I dictated the order in court I remember and I dismissed his petition so I thought you know he would uh, be very upset but interestingly Mr Malik he actually got up and said sir I am very happy that I have been heard and finally there is a closure right. all that I wanted was to be heard right. Right. and heard patiently I am I am not an unhappy with the result the result is what you given so there are litigants and litigants there are some right, litigants right. who will never rest right, 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 right. they will always find a motive i mean mm-hmm. uh, a judge ordinarily should have no motive when deciding one or the other he has to decide that is uh, something that he is uh, uh, you know sort of sworn to as i said no one likes to decide but we have to decide <laughs> absolutely you <laughs> can't make people happy So people who think it's an easy job, it isn't. <laughs> to that extent. No, I don't think so. Uh, because uh, firstly, it is not uh, recognized as a problem to begin with. And uh, when people find that someone has a mental health issue, there is a very little understanding. They always think that uh, he is off. put it uh, quote and quote off his rocker which is not true uh, because as i said there are degrees of uh, mental health issues and uh, therefore much needs to be done which is uh, something which is not uh, happened at least in our profession you need counselors you need uh, psychiatrists you need psychologists uh, which uh, should be readily and freely available i mean I think there is an increasing need 
for institutions to have counselors where people should be able to go to them and speak to them, not a psychiatrist, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. This is a country where uh, I read recently that uh, where nearly uh, more than 10% of your population is uh, suffering from mental health issues, which is about, about, about 150 million people or more. And what is surprising is 83% uh, don't uh, have uh, access to mental health uh, professionals. We have, uh, that, you know, that article said we had we have only 25,000 or more uh, professional, uh, you know, mental health professionals available. And child psychiatrists, uh, the board said 49 for the entire country. I mean, that that may be an understatement, <coughs> but I'm just. The problem, and this is backed by a WHO report, yes, yes. World Health Organization report. Now, if this is the state where 150 million people, and this was about a couple of years back, according to that report, suffer from mental health issues, it is a serious problem. And how much are we investing in mental health? Uh, it comes to, it boils down to about 4 rupees uh, per person, for, for, uh, per person, and you have what? What's it about 1.93 uh, persons, uh, professionals available for every one lakh? Uh, so, if these are the figures that we have, we have a serious problem. Uh, institutions need to recognize that you need to have counselors in house for people to talk. As I said, talking is the first step. Uh, so, and this is a good initiative that you need. You need uh, forums where people can talk about this so that uh, it is uh, not stigmatized. Just because someone has a mental health issue doesn't mean uh, the person can't function or do his job. So, the more you talk about it, the more uh, it will come out in the less uh, stigma will be attached to it. Family also plays a major role in building this family net around a person who is going through mental illness. So, do you think there should be a counselling for the families as well? How to deal with this? Because most of the time they are living in denial. They do not want to accept it. Yeah, you are absolutely right. I, I think uh, counselling should extend to the members of the family if uh, they volunteer for it. Because uh, the experience of most people is that uh, families, in fact, hide it. Uh, because of the stigma attached, if it's a girl, they'll say, okay, don't advertise it. Uh, don't take medication if you're required to take medication. Because who's going to, you know, in India, there is this huge amount of stress on marriage for some peculiar reason. Uh, and uh, therefore, the family says, okay, you know, don't advertise it and you'll be all right. Uh, you'll, they'll take you to some healer, etc., etc. Things will get so it doesn't get sorted out. You need professional help, and uh, which is why I said the more you advertise it, the more people will uh, you know come to the conclusion that there's no shame attached to the fact that uh, you're not uh, uh, you know, mentally well. Even school children uh, these days uh, need this kind of. Abroad, it is quite common. It is quite common for people of every age yeah, to go to a counselor. I don't have to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or whatever. It is quite common. People don't uh, take it on this. But uh, I think in India, there is still a uh, bunch of stigma attached to it. It is, in fact, worse than uh, being physically ill with a grievous uh, you know, disease. It is worse. Right. The people actually write you off. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they just write you off. That, you know, this guy is not all there, he can't perform. You get sad and then you become suicidal. And people have been known to take their lives. So, yeah, families uh, need to be engaged. It does, it does. Uh, or can get uh, stressful if uh, uh, the system doesn't uh, afford you an explanation. The 
as to why it is happening. You know, your your face uh, face with a wall like uh, situation. Uh, transfer. I, my personal view is transfer if done intelligently, it actually would uh, invigorate the system. I believe uh, cross pollen pollination <laughs> is good if. Uh, Suppose the Delhi High Court has a set of judges who have strength in a particular area. In another court, in another city, doesn't have uh, that kind of strength, but it has another kind of strength. Right. Right. If the policy makers were to uh, decide to shift people, and tell them I'm going to shift you for two years or one year or whatever, it would be good for the system. In the sense, you would take the strength from this court to the other court, and the other court uh, judges will come in and uh, lend support to whatever is there. But it is uh, it is not happening uh, uh, the way it should, uh, and therefore perhaps is causing uh, grief to people uh, when it is viewed as a punitive transfer. Right, right. Uh, but uh, the outcomes are not always necessarily worse. I can only tell you when I went. Uh, Madras, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I was uh, um, I was uh, welcomed by the bar and the bench, and uh, when I was to return back, uh, uh, a lot of members of the bar uh, when they bid me farewell, they said actually. It's now a loss for the Madras High Court and the game for Delhi High Court. So it sort of worked. So that was uh, something which was very endearing, and uh, I uh, I grew as a person, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, my personal growth as well as the growth of the judge. Because uh, when you go to the uh, to a place uh, where you are not born and brought up. You imbibe uh, the culture which is uh, prevailing there, and uh, uh, Tamil Nadu is a very rich culture. Uh, whether it is their music, whether it's their uh, temple architecture. Uh, Do they accept also people from the? Well, a lot of people don't. Be, uh, you know, uh, it may be difficult for you uh, to settle down there, but my experience was to the contrary. I mean, as I said, they accepted me with open arms. They were warm. In fact, uh, to this day, uh, right from my uh, driver to my uh, personal security officer to my uh, staff, uh, they, they 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 get in touch with me uh, whenever they want to, whether it is their good day or my good. You know, day or birthday, whatever they wish me. Uh, so that's the kind of bond uh, I have with them, and I feel very strongly about. Uh, so no, I wasn't worse off. But if you're asking me when it happened, uh, did I feel good about it? No. But in my case, I was lucky, uh, both uh, in Delhi, where uh, a lot of people stood up. And uh, supported me. In fact, uh, I must place it on record that uh, when I had my farewell, uh, late uh, Mr. Sarabji was in uh, court number one, and he sat through my farewell uh, speech. And why it was important for me is uh, I ended up in Mr. Salve's chamber, is because uh, Mr. Sarabji, uh, you know, at that time when I was looking from chamber to chamber. Mm-hmm. spoke to uh, mrs salve and said listen i have someone who is a chartered accountant also as you know mrs salve is also a chartered accountant so i'm sending this boy to you please uh, have him in your chamber right. so i did uh, say my favorite speech that i'm actually uh, late uh, mrs rajesh grand junior right in that sense right. so uh, and uh, of course apart from mrs rajesh there were others who who stood by him. Especially the lawyer fraternity, uh, 
with whom I had not been in touch since the time I, uh, you know, came onto the bench. But when uh, it came to a situation like this, you had friends out there who supported you. And therefore, I think I remained safe. <laughs> <laughs>
where you can speak to people. And if you have a, a good senior, actually, you must uh, go and talk to him because I have known of several people who are mentored well. And if you have an understanding senior, then uh, nothing like it. Uh, it is where uh, you start your journey from. At times, that becomes important uh, because that stays with you. Uh, the ethos that you imbibe for your profession. Do you want to be uh, a thoroughbred professional who loses job, or do you want to be uh, someone who only wants to you know, earn a lot of money, whichever means? Mm. So there are two routes in this profession. You need to choose very early what you want to do. Mm. Thank you.